The following is a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Who's in charge here? You ever been asked that question? Who's in charge here? Right? Who's responsible for what's going on? It's often a relevant question. Who's in charge of this project, this meeting, this situation? Because if there's a problem, we want to know who's responsible, and we want to know who has authority to do something about it. Who can make the necessary changes to fix what's going wrong? Well, we've seen in the Gospel of Mark, in his account of Jesus' life and ministry, from the very beginning, from the very first chapter, Jesus is presented as one who has authority. He's in charge, is Mark's answer. He's in charge in all parts of life. So he has authority over sickness. He has authority over evil spirits. He has authority to teach. They say, man, we've never heard anybody teach like this. Right? He has authority even over nature. Even the wind and the waves obey him. He has authority over sin. He has authority over death. Well, now we face in this passage today, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46 into chapter 11. In this passage, we see and encounter Jesus' authority over religion. He decides what is true religion, and he decides what is true worship. So our big idea this morning, Jesus is the royal son of God who curses fruitless religion and calls for confident faith in God. That's our big idea that I think reflects the teaching of our passage, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 11, verse 25. Jesus is the royal son of David who curses fruitless religion and calls for confident faith in God. So you can follow along or you can listen as I read uh, that entire passage. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, Why are you, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. 
As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Well, our sermon outline that we're going to follow is just that sentence that we had up broken into three parts. So, first, Jesus is the royal son of David. So back there in chapter 10, verse 46, the passage starts with another healing miracle. In many ways, it's similar to what we've seen in the past. We meet somebody who's got a serious health issue. They hope that Jesus will heal them, and Jesus does. He heals them. Immediately, he is healed. And Jesus says, as he said before, it's because of their faith that they have been healed. Now, in this story, one unique thing is we get the the man's name. We don't usually get the name of the person, Bartimaeus. Why would we get his name? Probably because the early readers of Mark would have known who he was. He was in that early church community, and so that was meaningful to them. Because usually when we we tell stories, the first name of the person is one of the first things that passes away. It's not really important. We just say, hey, there was this guy, if we didn't know him. And often that's what the gospel writers do. But in this case, they give us the name of Bartimaeus. Now, you might have noticed Jesus asks Bartimaeus the exact same question that he just asked James and John. Remember that in our last passage? He says, what do you want me to do for you? And James and John have an answer. They say, Lord... We want to sit at your right and your left in your kingdom. When you are coming in your power and your glory, we want to be honored right along with you. This is a very different request from Bartimaeus, so different. He says, humbly, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me recover my sight. Again, this is another healing miracle. We think, why is it included here? I think part of the reason Mark puts this miracle in, because there are a lot of miracles they leave out. John says, if we wrote down everything Jesus ever did, there wouldn't be enough room in all the world to store the books, right? There are a lot of things that are not recorded in Scripture. Why this miracle? We've already had a blind man being healed. Well, I think it serves his narrative structure very well. You remember the first eight chapters of Mark, Jesus' identity is being explored and being explained and being shown And then in chapter 8, we get to that important turning point. He says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, and he's right. And then, if you remember this, while the disciples don't fully understand who Jesus is, they say, you're the Christ. He starts saying, I'm going to suffer and die. And they say, no, Lord, you should never do that. And he rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan. The disciples don't quite understand, but they do recognize he's the Messiah. If you remember, just before that, Mark tells about a blind man who Jesus heals in two steps, right? He heals him, and he can start to see, but it's blurry. He says it looks like trees are walking around when he sees people. And Jesus touches him again, and then he's fully healed, right? There are two steps to that miracle, only miracle like that. Well, that miracle we saw serves as a picture of the disciples. They're spiritually blind. They've begun to see, but they don't fully see So they're right, Jesus, you're the Messiah, but they don't quite understand his mission. They don't understand what the Messiah has come to do. Their vision is still blurry. So that happened in the middle of chapter 8. And now here, middle of chapter 8 to the end of chapter 10, it's kind of the middle section of the Gospel of Mark where we have been learning from Jesus about the kingdom, about his suffering and death and resurrection. He's predicted it very clearly three times. And now we're to the end of that middle section of the book. And he ends it the same way that he began it with the healing of a blind man. And in this healing, Bartimaeus sees, but it's not just that he sees, it's also interesting what he calls Jesus. He calls him the son of David. It's a title that's not been used so far in the book of Mark. Son of David. What does that mean? Well, what do we know about Jesus? We know his earthly father was Joseph, and we know from other gospels that he was in the line of David. Right? So it's his family, King David, one of the most important characters in the Old Testament. He's in the line of David. But the people listening, whether or not they knew that about his lineage, they would have recognized son of David as a, as a term alluding to the Messiah. The Messiah or the Christ means the anointed one. 
The long-awaited Messiah would be an anointed king who would reign on the throne of his father David. So on your own time, you can look up 2 Samuel chapter 7. David says, I want to build a temple. And God comes to him and he speaks to him and he declares this covenant with David about a thousand years before this time that we're reading here. And he promises that there will be one who reigns on his throne, a son of David, a descendant who will have a great name, whose kingdom will never end. So by saying son of David, he's essentially saying that guy, the guy who's been promised, the Messiah, is the term he's giving to Jesus. And what stands out, if you've been paying attention, Jesus doesn't rebuke him. As we go forward, Jesus stops silencing people. So many times in the Gospel of Mark, when people say, you are the Holy One or you're the Son of God, he will silence them, right? And that seems to be because it's not time yet. He doesn't want to stir up an agitation. He doesn't want Rome to get involved. He doesn't want a revolution to start. It's not time yet. But now the times have changed. And starting in chapter 11, it's the culmination of his mission. It's the beginning of the end. So now when he's called the son of David, he doesn't correct. And there in verse, uh, in chapter 11, the crowds are saying the same things, only even more boldly and more clearly. They're beginning to see, at least in part, who Jesus is. And he doesn't silence them. So in chapter 11, he's approaching Jerusalem, where he says everything that he's been predicting is going to go down. Suffering, death, resurrection. And he sends the disciples ahead to get a colt. And I think in that we see more evidence that this is not just accidentally stumbling into a trap. This is Jesus enacting God's plan. All that's going to happen in Jerusalem is part of his sovereign plan. And he tells them exactly where to go. They get the colt and they bring it back. And he's not saying openly at this point, I'm the Christ, I'm the son of God. But he's starting to acknowledge his identity by his actions, especially by riding up on a colt that has never been ridden. Because riding a beast of burden, especially one that's never been ridden, is typical of a royal procession. You see Sol- Solomon doing this in the Old Testament. And you even have a prophecy that's not explicitly listed in Mark, but it is in other Gospels, in Zechariah that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king, this long-awaited king, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the crowds, they're already excited about Jesus and his ministry, and now they recognize this as a royal approach to Jerusalem, and they celebrate him as king, and they spread branches and cloaks on the ground before the colt. They're laying out the red carpet for him. They say, he is is worthy of this kind of treatment. And they're shouting, Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? Hosanna literally would mean save us or save us now. But it also more generally had been an exclamation of praise, kind of like we would say, hallelujah, hallelujah, hosanna. So look at what they're saying there, verses 9 and 10. They say, hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, hosanna in the highest. They're quoting from Psalm 118. Psalms 113 through 118 are these psalms of ascent that pilgrims would say aloud to one another as they went up and approached Jerusalem, the holy city, for celebration. Celebrations like the Feast of Tabernacles, like the Passover that we're about to see in our text in a couple of weeks. And at the end of Psalm 118, which is where this verse comes from, it had been associated not only with past victories, but with a future victory of God's people through this coming king, this coming Davidic king. So it was fitting to quote this psalm in this verse when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the psalm. And then they add, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. The king is coming, which means the promised kingdom is coming. Are they right? Well, they are right to hope in Jesus as their Messiah. But they still probably don't have a real clear view of Jesus and his mission. The disciples are still struggling to understand. And they have received this clearest private teaching on the kingdom of God that he's bringing. And only a few others 
have heard him predict his suffering and death. The crowds almost certainly are hoping for a nationalistic victory, a political, a military rebellion and overthrow of occupying Roman forces. That's almost certainly what they're excited about. But even if their celebration is partly misguided for now, Jesus allows them to praise him as who he is, the son of David, the coming king. And as the king proceeds into Jerusalem, the holy city, then to the very place we might expect to the temple of God, the temple that David had envisioned, that Solomon had built. It was the footstool of God's heavenly throne. It was the place of his presence. Well, this must be the place where the king's going to be revealed. This must be the place where he's going to be embraced, maybe even enthroned. But we find that Jerusalem does not receive Jesus as king. The crowds that are shouting Hosanna are not people from Jerusalem, right? They have just been in Jericho with Jesus. They're probably mostly people from Galilee. They've been following Jesus' ministry. They sing his praises and they use those words, Psalm 118, 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the very next line in that same verse is we bless you from the house of the Lord. So the crowds are blessing him as one who comes in the name of the Lord, but we're going to see that Jerusalem and her religious leaders are not going to do the rest of the verse. They are not going to bless him from the house of the Lord, from the temple. It's going to be very different in the temple. In verse 11 there, he goes straight to the temple. He looks around, doesn't say anything. It's late. He leaves Jerusalem to stay in Bethany with the twelve. And the following verses sandwich his return to the temple with this unusual story about the fig tree, right? So you got fig tree, temple, and then goes back to the fig tree. And in these verses, we find that Jesus curses fruitless religion. Now, the story about the fig tree is unusual, and it might be a total mystery to us, if not for the temple in between that helps explain it. When, when the, the writers sandwich things like this, they're usually doing it for a reason and on purpose, Not that these things didn't happen. They did truly happen. But the way they're telling the story is to help us understand and make sense of what's happened. So you start there. Let's start with the temple scene, and then we'll go back to look at the fig tree. Look at it again, verse 15. They came to Jerusalem, and he, Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. The king shows up and he asserts his authority concerning the proper worship of God and the proper use of God's house. That's what is happening when Jesus so boldly, so audaciously shows up and tells them what's supposed to be happening in the temple. And he is fired up. He has zeal for God, and here it's expressed in his righteous anger. Right? Man's anger is sinful, but there is a such thing as righteous anger. That's not usually what our anger is characterized by, right? What makes us upset? Uh, We get mad at things that affect us negatively. But righteous anger that we see here in Jesus is focused on God receiving the worship that he deserves. That's what Jesus cared about. He cared about people not being hindered from the worship of God. That's what made him upset. Our anger is often sinful. But there is this category that we need to have for righteous anger And we need to remember that a lack of anger, on my part, does not always indicate godliness, right? Apathy or indifference toward false worship are not Christ-like. They're not virtuous. What what exactly was it that made Jesus so upset? Well, to understand this, you've got to pay attention here to the context. A little bit of background information could be helpful. The location of this scene is the temple But more particularly, it's this outer court of the temple, often called the court of the Gentiles. And there are merchants set up there, and they're doing a couple of things. Two services they're providing, at least. 
One, they're selling animals for sacrifices. Why would they do that? Well, when pilgrims are coming from outside of the city, it wasn't very convenient or easy for them to bring animals many miles from home. So they would wait and they would purchase animals for sacrifice when they got to Jerusalem. And they could be sure that this animal was proper for sacrifice, that it was kosher, fit for a sacrifice when they got to Jerusalem. A second service is changing money. These outsiders would have to transfer their coins to use a currency that was more similar to the old temple shekel. So these services seem like on the surface they would be necessary. Why would Jesus be so upset about them? I think mainly the reason he's upset is because of their location, where all this is happening. So when he says in verse 17, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. I think by selling and changing money in the temple courts, they were turning the temple into a marketplace. The temple was the house of God. The temple was the place where God's people could approach God's presence, where they could offer sacrifices for sins that had kept them, that had prohibited them from God's presence. They could make prayers to God. And in fact, if you read back in Kings, when Solomon is dedicating the temple, he talks about the people praying toward the temple, which is unusual because we don't think or pray like that anymore. But they were to pray toward the temple. Why? Because it was, in a sense, this meeting of heaven and earth at the temple. God would hear prayers rightly offered to him, and they should be directed toward the temple. So the temple itself is a place where they approach God's presence, a place of prayer, but they're treating it like a market. Look there in verse 16. Jesus says, would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Apparently, the temple court was being used as a shortcut. Right? So they were, it was inconvenient to have to walk all the way around it, to go all the way around it when you're in the city and you want to get to the Mount of Olives or vice versa. So they were cutting through. They were acting as though there's nothing sacred about this place. It's kind of hard to get our minds back into that world and what that must have looked like or felt like. But you think of our place here, this room here. Now, we don't believe that this building or this room is sacred, right? There is nothing sacred about it. It's not like the temple. We have access to God through Jesus Christ. We worship and we gather as God's people through Jesus Christ. So it's nothing sacred about this place. But for the sake of illustration, just imagine that in a time like this, in a time of worship, you have a lot of commotion. Even in the back of this room, there are people selling Bibles and bulletins and handing them out and being loud about it. Other people are using it as a shortcut from one wing to the other, right? Well, that would be incredibly distracting. That would hinder the very reason that we have gathered together. That would be counterproductive. The sale of animals, the changing of money in the temple courts, sanctioned by the religious leaders, hindered God's purpose for the temple. It interrupted the prayerful worship that should have been taking place there. And I think the problem is even worse than that because a certain group is being hindered, whether intentionally targeted or not, they are being hindered from worship and prayer. Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Jesus cares though the religious leaders don't seem to care, that this disruption is happening in the court of the Gentiles. Now, they might have thought, oh, I mean, it's just the Gentiles. If we're going to have a disruption, this is the place to have it. We'll keep it outside of the temple proper and near the holy place. But Jesus is angered by actions that prevent Gentile prayer and Gentile worship. And we see this unfolding theme. We've seen it in the Old Testament, but now it's coming to a head in the new with Jesus that God doesn't want just one family or one ethnicity to worship him. He wants the nations. That's why, as those who are followers of Jesus, our desire is to see the nations, people from every tribe and tongue and language and people and nation, worship the one true God, as we will fully experience in the new heavens and the new earth. We read about that in Revelation, right? That's one reason that we send workers to other parts of the world to spread the news about Jesus. We don't want just people here around us. We want people who've never heard, people from every tribe and tongue, and especially those who don't even have scripture in their own language, 
to know Christ, to worship the one true God. That's also why we love having people of different ethnicities worshiping together. We love seeing a visual reminder of the truths we see here, that God is a God of all peoples and all nations, and everyone has access to him through Jesus Christ. Well, the chief priests and the scribes have had enough of Jesus. Right, he's already done some pretty touchy things. He's, in their minds, he's undermined the Sabbath. The Sabbath was sacred, and he's doing things like healing on the Sabbath and defending it. He's already questioned their ceremonial food laws. Back in chapter 7, when he says, yeah, it's really not about what's outside of the body that goes in. It's about what's inside of you. For out of your heart come sinful desires and sinful acts and sinful thoughts and sinful words. The problem isn't just the food, it's you, it's your hearts. Well, they've already been upset at this, and now they believe he is undermining the place of the temple. And they will, in fact, use his treatment of the temple to accuse him and condemn him. Just a little tidbit, you notice in, the, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is preaching, he's stoned after his whole sermon, which includes, right near the end, an undermining of the role of the temple, for God does not dwell in houses made by human hands. That seems to be part of what pushed them over the edge. Now, you might have expected, we might have thought that Jesus, getting this great reception in Galilee, having all these crowds, when he finally comes to Jerusalem, would be embraced, would maybe even be enthroned. But sadly, the closer you get to the center of that religious system, the further you got from the heart of God. It was the exact opposite of what we might have hoped or expected. And I think it's a warning for any of us who would find security in our proximity to the things of God. Right? Don't be tricked into thinking that being close to the things of God makes you right with God. The people here, they're at the center of religious activity. These are chief priests, and they believe they are true worshipers of God, but without knowing it, they're actually opposed to God. It's a sobering thought. You see there in verse 18, they heard what Jesus is saying, and they seek a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. What a contrast between these religious leaders and Jesus. Jesus is zealous for true worship of God by all people. The chief priests and scribes are zealous, but for something very different. They're zealous for the attention of people. They want the praise of man. They want people to follow them. They want to be thought of well. So they're afraid of Jesus because he is threatening and undermining the followership of these, their followers. You also see Jesus, he's willing to destroy things. He's willing to destroy things that rob people and prevent worship of God. They are willing to destroy any person who robs them of the glory they so desperately want. Just a sharp contrast, almost mirror images and opposites of one another. I think understanding a little more about that temple scene can inform how we approach the fig tree account. So look at that again, verse 12. This is right before the temple, right after this entry to Jerusalem. It says, on the following day, they came from Bethany. He was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. He went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then down in verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. This is an interesting and unusual miracle in that it is destructive, right? Jesus has a fig tree wither, and it has caused a lot of puzzling as people say, why is Jesus almost seemingly unreasonable in his expectations of this poor tree, right? It's not the season for figs. So why is he upset at the tree? Well, a couple of things to know. One, fig trees produce first small figs that are not fully ripe, but they're edible. These little green things, these little unripe figs, but they can be eaten. Then after that come the leaves 
And then there's the full ripening of the figs. So the presence of leaves would mean that normally there would be small green figs that one could eat. So that's probably why he approaches the tree because it would be an expectation of those around him that there would be these little unripe figs. But even though this tree has leaves, it's completely barren. It has nothing on it. But more important for us to understand is we need to recognize what Jesus is doing here. He is using this tree to illustrate the fruitless old covenant worship that's going on in the temple. So the fig tree is an enacted parable. He tells parables, and this this time he's acting out a parable, illustrating temple worship that had devolved into empty, outward expressions of worship. Again, I think we see a warning in this, that we should never be impressed with mere outward appearances of worship, whether in ourselves or someone else. We should never be impressed with that because it's possible to present a form of godliness and yet really... Underneath the leaves, it's fruitless religion. And Jesus knows the truth. I think it reminds us of this, the parable back in chapter 4. This, this time we've got a, a fig tree withered to the roots. And he's used the same terms back in chapter 4 about that rocky soil. It received the word, but then it withered because it had no roots. Those people look okay for a while, but the word is not really planted in them, so their faith doesn't last. The word, the message about Jesus must be received in order for true spiritual life to take root and grow and bear fruit. And apart from this word, it's just leafy religion, right? It it looks promising, it looks hopeful, but when you take a closer look, there's not actually good fruit there. I think you can see how this connects a little bit to that temple scene. Often we talk about the temple as being a, a cleansing of the temple, We could also say in a very real sense, in the fig tree in the temple, we see Jesus pronouncing judgment on the temple. Just as he's cursed the fig tree, there is, in a sense, a judgment pronounced on the temple. The Old Testament prophets we already read about this morning, they decried fruitlessness in God's people. They called for repentance. They called for renewal. Jesus calls for those things, but he also does something new. The temple and the ceremonial religion of that time are passing away once and for all. And he is pronouncing that. The temple and ceremonial religion are passing away. He says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And Jesus himself is going to become and fulfill the things that the temple was. So he's going to be the place that we have access to God. And he is today. He is the mediator in whose name we pray. We don't pray to the temple. We pray in Jesus' name to the Father. He is going to be this once-for-all sacrifice by which we are forgiven. So if you're here today, whether you've been in church a lot or not much, and you think, I I want access to God. I want to know the God who made me. Well, you don't have to go to a special sacred place. You don't have to come to a room like this. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go to Rome or anywhere else. You need to come to Jesus. Jesus provides access to God. How does he do that? Well, because Jesus lived a perfect life, right? We've we've disobeyed God in many ways. We've disregarded the God who made us. But Jesus never did that. And yet he died a, a death that we deserve. Sinners like us should have died. But he died in the place of sinners who trust in him. So if you want access to God, you come through Jesus who died as a substitute, who died for sinners, who rose again over death, who rose again to conquer the grave. Even as I'm saying these words right now, you can trust in him. You can turn from your sin and you can have access to God, not just for a moment, not just on an annual pilgrimage, but for all of life and into eternity. You can be right with God through Christ. After Jesus rejects fruitless religion. He calls for confident faith in God, starting there in verse 22. He teaches on faith and prayer. So we notice with these side by side that the end of temple religion, the end of temple religion does not mean the end of true religion. Praise God. That is not the end. Faith remains and it's centered not in a temple made with human hands, but in Jesus himself. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
not some old covenant religious institutions, not any outward expressions of worship, but Christ. And we come to God through him. We also see that the end of the temple as a place of prayer is not the end of prayer itself. Praise God. Prayer continues, not in a physical house of prayer, but in the praying people of God, the praying community of God. Now, Jesus here in these verses, 23 through 25, he calls for faith in God expressed in confident prayer. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes in what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now we can struggle, I'm guessing some of you are struggling right now, to, to try to understand how do we handle these strong words? Does it really mean that a mountain can be thrown into the sea? And if I don't see that happen, does that mean I lack faith? Or that nobody's ever really had faith because I've never seen a miracle like this? Well, I think... On the mountain part, I do think it's, in a sense, hyperbole because Jesus and the apostles certainly never do this. And we trust that Jesus could because he walked on water. He's calmed the seas. He never has a mountain actually do this. I think it symbolizes, though, the impossible. So the mountain symbolizes the impossible, being thrown into the sea. We think back to the rich young ruler and the disciples say, man, Jesus, if this guy can't be saved, he's so good. He's so obedient. He's rich. He's had your blessing. If he can't be saved, who can be? And Jesus says, well, with God, and only with God, is this possible. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, we can understand how somebody would take a verse like this and kind of use it as a name it, claim it approach to prayer. I've known people who have physical issues, clear physical issues, who are unwilling to seek treatment, and who say, not that they will be healed, but that they have been healed because they take it by faith that they've been healed. And yet go for months or years without any healing. And I trust the sincerity of these people. I think they sincerely believe, as evidenced by their failure to get medical attention, they believe this. So what do we do with that? Are they, are they rightly obeying this word? Or others who believe God for some blessing. They believe God for a new car and they thank him for the car that they have received by faith even as they continue to take the bus to work. What do we do with that? We want to obey these verses. How do we understand them? Many of us would shake our heads at people acting like this and say, man, they're just denying reality. And it's true. I don't think we're ever called to deny reality. I don't think we see this in the Bible. I don't think we find in the New Testament people acting or believing as if something that clearly is true is not true. But what do we make of the teaching here? Is it a blank check? Can we have whatever we want? Just ask and believe. Well, when we face a verse like this that puzzles us, it's good to remember that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Somebody has said, never read a Bible verse. Right? That's provocative. Never read a Bible verse. What do they mean by that? The point is, no single verse contains all biblical truth. So you always need to interpret a truth in light of its context, in light of the surrounding verses, and ultimately including all of the Bible. Because if we ever understand one verse to mean something that would contradict the clear teaching of other passages, we can be sure that we are wrongly understanding the one verse. So in the case of this verse, we recognize from other biblical texts that there's, there are more factors at play than just simply, did you ask it and are you convinced it will happen? What are some of those other factors? Well, our heart posture and our human relationships matter. You think of 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter says to husbands, you must treat your wives as your spiritual equals so that nothing will hinder your prayers. If you mistreat your wives, your prayers could actually be hindered. Though you ask for something and believe it, it could be hindered by the way you're treating your wife. Or right here in verse 25, we see that forgiveness of others is required. So if you're praying, you realize you're hanging on to bitterness against someone else, Jesus says, forgive them. Because if you're stubbornly unwilling, not just struggling to, but unwilling to forgive someone else, maybe even justifying your bitterness, holding on to it as this is my right, 
You might actually be cutting yourself off from God's forgiveness of you. The heart that is unwilling to forgive another is not bearing fruit as one who's been forgiven of God. So the heart posture matters. Our relationships with others matter. They affect our prayers. Our relationship to Christ matters also. Jesus says, John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. There's a big if. Ask whatever you will and it will be done for you if you abide in me and my words abide in you. We must abide in Christ. His words must abide in us. Our motives matter. James chapter 4. James says, you don't have because you don't ask. Okay, I don't have, so I don't ask because I don't ask. Well, then I'll ask. And then he goes on, and when you ask God for things, you still don't receive them because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. He says, your motives stink. You're asking for selfish reasons, which means you're asking wrongly, and that's why you're not getting many of the things you're asking for. One author put it this way. He said, faith, rightly based and placed, assumes alignment with his will rather than some fallacy or figment of selfish desire. In other words, this verse is not a promise to get whatever my greedy, lustful heart desires. It's not what this is. And I think that brings us to the most important qualifier that encapsulates all the previous ones I've mentioned. Our requests must align with God's will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we had toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So when we pray with faith and our requests align with God's will, we will receive whatever it is that we ask for. Jesus' prayers were answered because they always aligned with the will of the Father. And even Jesus, we see wrestling with these realities in the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll see that in a few weeks. But as a preview of that, he says to the Father, Father, crying out, boldly praying, pleading, let me be spared of this suffering, this death, this cup, let it pass. And yet, not my will but yours be done. So I think we can pray boldly for things that are impossible apart from God and at the same time submit ourselves to his will in everything. I think that's what we're called to do. If what we ask for is not his will, then we can be thankful that we didn't receive it, right? As a wise man said, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, right? Well, there's some truth to that. There's some truth. We're thankful that we don't get everything we ask for. But, all of those qualifiers said. We don't want to just focus on what other verses might inform this verse. We also want to benefit from Jesus' teaching here. And remember that his teaching is not just a puzzle for us to try to figure out. It's not a burden for us to bear. It's heavenly instruction for us to obey and to enjoy. Jesus isn't calling us to do something particularly painful here. He's saying, Believe that God is able and willing to answer our prayers. And that's good news. So we, we should be thankful. Even if we don't fully understand how that always works out in our life, we should be thankful for that. And it should spur us on to confident faith that he will do what we ask in accordance with his will. So we can pray bold and confident prayers, especially when we know that our prayers or we think that our prayers are aligned with his will. So when we see things in Scripture and we pray those things in Scripture— his will is for our sanctification. I can pray that with confidence that God will, by his grace, conform me to the image of Christ. And, and if I'm delighting myself in him, that's going to be one of the things I want more than anything else. We think about praying for wisdom like James tells us. John Frame is helpful here. He says, you have it up there on the screen, if we believe that our prayer is in God's will, then we must believe that he will grant it. Of course, we may be wrong in the previous step and therefore in this one. And of course, if along with prayer for what we want, we pray in our hearts, thy will be done, then we know that our prayer will always be answered. A couple more comments on these verses. Several commentators point out the, the you in these verses is plural, right? That doesn't come through in English. You learn that in Greek class. There's no way in English 
in modern English for us to indicate plural, unless you say y'all. Most of your Bibles probably don't say y'all, but it is plural here for you. Uh, So the teaching is not just for an individual and about their prayer life, but it's for the praying community, not just for you, it's for us. So here's a really clever point of application. We should pray as a church. We should pray. When we gather together and we pray together and we ask that God would do great things in us and through us as a church, we honor him. We show that we believe that he's able to do things that are impossible apart from him. So we, we don't want to just ask for things that we're like, I think, I think this will probably happen anyway, so it seems safe and I won't look bad or feel too disappointed. No, let's pray for big things, boldly, submitting to his will, but asking him to do great things. I love hearing you all pray when we gather together as a church. In our Sunday morning gatherings, especially in our Sunday evening and members meeting times, when we pray for one another, and then to hear of answered prayer, it just encourages our faith collectively in what God is doing. It reminds us that he is at work among us, that he does work mightily, that he does things that in our weakness and in our doubt, we might question whether or not he would do. But we, we pray with faith, with expectation, and he so often does more than what we had even hoped or expected. Let's pray that God would do this work among us. Let's pray that he would make us more of a praying church. And when we do pray, let's not be small-minded, only asking for those little things that are probably going to happen anyway. Let's ask boldly for good things that would honor him insofar as we can tell, and then rejoice with him when he does answer those prayers. Well, in the coming weeks, we're entering the climax of Jesus's ministry, and we see again how his authority extends to all of life. In this case, he is in charge of true religion, of true worship. He curses leafy, fruitless religion of the temple. He rejects mere outward appearance of godliness that lacks faith. And he calls us to something so much better. He calls us to himself, and he calls us to put our faith confidently in a father who loves us, who loves to answer the requests of his children. Let's pray right now. This has been a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church, please visit castleview.org.